great to be here. And I'm gonna take us on a little trip. I just got back from Africa two days ago. And I was in Ethiopia and Kenya. And I've thought a lot about the theme for TEDx SMU this year, human survival. And my concept of survival based on conversation. And not just conversation, but kind of like the icky conversation. Like the conversation like when you're wiggling a tooth and it hurts, but it feels good, but you kind of want to keep doing it. And how you can make that be part of your life and how you can access better conversations with others if you're willing to go there. So we're going to Ethiopia, like I said. I went to Ethiopia the first time for coffee. I went there to research this rare coffee. It was really exciting. It was supposed to get $150 a pound. We were going to find it in Ethiopia. But while I was there, I got distracted by that. These really big, unclimbed sandstone towers that reach 500 feet into the, into the sky. I'm a professional rock climber. I've been a mountain guide for 12 years. This is what makes me tick. So I put together a team of four women to go do first ascents on these towers. Doing a first ascent means you're the first person to go up there. You're the first person to do technical climbing in that area. Well, world, word travels really fast in Ethiopia when you put a team of four women together to go rock climbing. And in about two weeks after I made the plan, I was approached by an Ethiopian publisher to write a book about the experience. And the Ethiopian publisher, based in Addis Ababa, didn't just want me to write a book about the experience, he wanted me to take the experience and change Ethiopia through rock climbing. No small task. He's like, yeah, that's cool. Like, why don't you just go to Ethiopia, go climb and make it really cool, write a book, and let rock climbing change Ethiopia forever. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. I got, you know, three other women who are pretty strong, so we can probably make anything happen. So we went after it. Um, we headed into a country where the majority of people make less than a dollar a day with $15,000 worth of climbing gear. We went to the Geralta Mountains. The Geralta Mountains are a series of sandstone upthrusts up in northern Ethiopia. They're famous for the rock-hewn churches. So there are churches that are perched high up here that people access through chasms, through volcanic rift cuts. They do a little bit of climbing to get there, but when we arrived, no one had actually climbed the main faces of these escarpments. That's really exciting when you're a climber, because people always want to be first. For some reason, we think that makes us better. For, I'm, I'll debate with you about that later. Now, while we were in Geralta, this place that we were going climbing, this place was famous a long time ago. It was famous in, that, maybe not that long ago, in 1984 as the seat of the famine in Ethiopia. That was a famine where a million people were killed, another six million people were affected, and kids like me back in the US watched this on TV with rapt attention. I was eight, like I said, we got a new TV that year. I watched the Miss Universe pageant and kept notes, okay? I was like trying to figure out who was gonna win, and then I would go onto the commercials and I'd see all this information about Ethiopia and adopting a kid in Ethiopia, and I adopted a kid in Ethiopia, right? Like I had a pen pal, I'd write him little notes, I sent him part of my allowance, and then when Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie and Cindy Lauper and everybody got fired up and they wrote We Are the World, I wrote my own song. I want to help a kid in Ethiopia. I had to tell the kids yesterday it's okay to laugh. Like this is fine, you know? Nobody else can help this one. And I did have this haircut and these glasses when I sang this. Need somebody to care for them. But some people don't even cry about them. Here's the chorus. Hold on, it gets really good. People in Ethiopia want. Okay. So it keeps going on. And I'll tell you that not only does it get better, it starts talking about turkeys. Because I was really worried about the people in Ethiopia, because I was like, you know, you have Christmas and you don't have a turkey. Well, as it turns out, I've now spent a lot of time in Ethiopia, and I'm kind of spot on about the turkeys. There's not that many around there, right? <laughs> but I was sort of, like, I was a little bit incorrect about other things, but I was giving it. Like, I, I wrote a three and a half minute ballad. I warbled my voice, okay? And then I forgot all about it. Okay, when I went to Ethiopia the first time, I wasn't thinking, thank God, this is my lifelong dream. I'm finally going to Africa, to Ethiopia, where I've written my song that I've been singing for the past 10 years. No, totally absent from my mind, forgot about it. I had written a book about Ethiopia. I'd been on a tour for a year and a half, given like 60 lectures about it, and my mother sends me an email, and she said, I found a song you wrote when you were eight. She sent it to me, and I said, Mom, you know, remember those 60 things? Remember how I've been stressed out all this year, and I've been traveling all over? This song would have helped me. Well, now it's vaulting me into this next position, and it's reminding me that there was something when I was eight that fixated me that's kind of come back inside. So after I was eight, 20, whatever that is, 23 years after that is when I was climbing in Ethiopia, and I was going to write this book to save Ethiopia. Well, 
The climbing, like when you actually climb, what you want to do is you want to put your hands and your feet in a crack. You want that crack to be solid, okay? So this is sort of a picture of it down here. And then you go upward and you twist and you torque your feet and you reach again. And you put in pieces of protection. Here's a couple pictures of what those look like. And those are your safety and you climb up. You do not climb using the rope. You climb using your body and the rock that's there. This is the way it worked in Ethiopia for about 80 feet, okay? And after that point, with about 800 feet to go, everything went to hell in a handbasket. The reason is because the rock quality sucked, okay? There's really no better way to put that. And all this idea that we were gonna go and climb this sandstone, well, sandstone's soft, right? Like sandstone, sand, sand, stone. Which, which word comes first? Sand. Sand is granular. It comes apart. It comes off in your hands. There are some places where there's amazing sandstone that's been sort of fortified and calcified and it's wonderful. But that's not Ethiopia. And suddenly we're there and we're climbing and I'm thinking, oh, this is why people haven't climbed here. Because it's actually really bad. But now I'm climbing here. So this picture right here, most of the pictures in this are really good because they're professional photographers. And this picture is bad because this was taken by my partner when she was scared and I was scared. I'm holding the rope. Remember how I said you don't hold the rope when you climb? I'm holding the rope right there and I'm looking up and I'm having this debate in my head that says, how much is this worth it? Do I want to die in Ethiopia? It is four hours to the closest hospital. Bring your own blood for transfusion. We had a bunch of needles in case we needed to have an accident, but I didn't even want to go to that hospital, okay? I didn't want to get stung by a scorpion. I didn't want to find a snake. I didn't want to take a big fall and I'm climbing friable rock. Now, Let's you know, go ahead and talk a little more. In addition to writing songs when I was little, I was also sort of obsessed with adventure. And this is a photo of me after my senior year in high school. I was in the Arctic. I was on the Anderson River to the Arctic Ocean on a 45-day expedition with five other women. I climb with men, too, but for some reason, both of these trips have to do with women. And I'm on this trip, and when I was a kid, like adventure was worth it if it was difficult and if it was remote. And if you didn't have those two things, then you're kind of a, a wuss, okay? Like it wasn't worth it. Like if you, this trip was really cool because for 45 days we were self-supported and we weren't gonna see another human, right? Because we were in the wilderness and wilderness meant total preservation. Well, lo and behold, we're like 39 days into this trip and who do we see but this local Inuit family? And I was mad when I saw them, okay? We're like paddling along in the Arctic Ocean, totally preserved in our vision of, version of beauty and exploration. And on the horizon, I see this thing that looks like person. And I want to just keep paddling. I was like, I am not stopping. I'm not, they're not there. I'm not talking to them. Well, of course, everyone else wanted to pull up and talk to them. And we did. We spent the night with them. And in my journal on that night, I wrote, my expedition is over. Today we saw people. I was 17. They ruined it for me. I could no longer say I went 45 days without seeing people. I had to see these people in their backyard. I mean, that was really inconvenient for me, right? Like, it was sort of rude of them to do that. And in the midst of that, then I go to Ethiopia, and suddenly I'm climbing right here. This is the edge of a rock face. There's a crack right here that I'm, you know, kind of torquing my body into, and below me is an entire village. Okay, and not just any village. This was a village that was forced into being a village during the regime of the dirt. So Emperor Haile Selassie gets dethroned. This is sort of before the 84 famine. The dirt, a communist Marxist socialist regime takes over Ethiopia, pretty bloody, pretty bad, called the Red Terror affectionately. Okay, they would force people in northern Ethiopia, these were their biggest opposition, into basically suburbia. And they created suburbia for a group of people who were farmers. So people were far away from their crops, from water, and they were managed this way. Now further down the road, right about up here, there's a town called Hausen. Hausen, in 1988, on a Wednesday on market day, was bombed by the Red Terror. 2,500 people were killed. 800 livestock, that's a big number, 800 livestock when you're talking about a farming community, completely obliterated, okay? This is where I was climbing. We were surrounded by children and people all the time. This was not the remote wilderness. This was wilderness unlike I, I didn't have any construct for it. I'm like, well, I'm adventuring, but the rock kind of sucks, but I'm trying to write this book, and there are all these people around me, and where do I put all this? Like, how do I actually put it? Where does it go? How can I make it go somewhere? And I struggled with that for a really long time when I was working on this book and I tried to tell the publisher I wasn't gonna write it and they reminded me they paid for my trip and I thought, well, yes, this is a good detail. And I kept thinking like, all right, suck it up. Like, why can't you just tell this story? And the only way I could figure out how to tell it was to pick the middle. So what's really easy is to like hop over here and say Ethiopia is poor, it's desolate, it's having these troubles and we need to help it. Or it's easy to step over here and say, the people of Ethiopia are so happy and they're so wonderful and it's so great. Well, what happens when you step here? This feels kind of icky, 
right? This feels like that, oh God, my tooth is loose. It's kind of fun, but I kind of want to be over here and I kind of want to be over here, but I'm going to just make myself stay here. I'm going to stay here and say the people were amazing and welcoming and they robbed us, okay? The rock was amazing for 80 feet and then it got really bad and then it got good again. I'm going to negotiate that middle ground. And when I wrote this book, I made a commitment to myself that climbing gave me access to finding this middle, which I decided I kind of liked, and then I was going to try to find that middle space for other people. And the way I did that, and what I've been working on for the past three years, is by doing that with coffee. Okay, so I told you I went to Ethiopia the first time for coffee, coming full circle in my life, working on that in my 30s, and uh, we're going back to coffee. Coffee is everybody's in the world singular common connection with Ethiopia. Because no matter where the coffee you're drinking came from, originally, way back when, it came from Ethiopia. Because this is where all coffee in the world is from. Okay? In Ethiopia, you have over 10,000 different varieties of coffee. I'm not talking like you have a caramel macchiato and a latte. I'm talking about different flavors. I'm talking about grapes. Think of coffee like wine. Okay? Make it a little sexier in your mind. Think about going to a restaurant and getting a coffee list like you would a wine list and running down it and saying, what flavors do I want to have? What expressions? What notes? Berries? Citrus? What is it? Watch the coffee cool. Change it on your palate. This is, this is possible. And where all this the, the site of this genetic diversity is right here in Ethiopia, okay? I'm an optimist, kind of insanely so. And I have this theory that if people understood that about Ethiopia, that this is this huge resource for coffee, then you can take something like coffee, which is a pretty controversial commodity, and you could change Ethiopia with it. And changing Ethiopia has a big impact in the world. It's one of the 15 poorest countries in the world. It has massive population, and it also has this, it, this is, coffee's already there. This is not saying, why don't we go to, go to Ethiopia and you know, maybe they can manufacture cell phones. Well, you know what, they already have coffee and they have a lot of it. And if you listen to legend, they've had it since 10th century BC when the Queen of Sheba time, okay? And they've been using it since then. So why don't we go local by going to origin? Why don't we start talking about coffee that way? Ethiopia has 80 languages and 200 dialects. In all of those languages, coffee is the same. It's called Buna. Buna is coffee everywhere you go. This is a country that was never colonized in Africa. This is a hugely prideful country. And the stories about coffee there are amazing and they blow you away. And all of these people, they're in my book and they're people who I got to know and they have stories about how coffee decided their marriage, how depending on how they were drinking their cup of coffee, it determined the sex of their baby. It determined if they were going to have a friend or a foe with a person who walked across their foyer. It made their entire educational upbringing stop because they had to go and cultivate it. it renewed their sense in religion. It's in ancient czar ceremonies that blend the Beta Israel, Muslim beliefs, and Orthodox Christian Christianity. It's everywhere in Ethiopia in these stories. And at the back of that, it's also a commodity. So here's the thing. Like, this woman right here is dropping off a, a, a bushel of red coffee cherry, okay? One kilogram of coffee cherry in Ethiopia, a farmer's gonna get between seven to 35 cents for. Well, we're gonna pay on the other side of that between two and $15 for a cup of that coffee that use a 20th of what that person dropped off. That's, that, I mean, talk about icky. That's pretty icky, right? And there's this huge global outcry, like let's fix coffee, let's have fair trade, let's have organic, let's have shade grown. Well, my big outcry is, Let's talk about the people who are growing it and not just say, here's the stamp on it, but why could we think about it differently if we have the personal stories? Because I believe that instead of just having economic development, that you have to attach that to the humanity. Because if you don't, then economic development is what we're going to advocate for, and the humanity is going to get left behind. And people are going to move through their lives, and they're going to jump too fast. Okay? You had that. You go into other countries, and all of a sudden, you went from being ideal, idyllic and bucolic to having plastic everywhere. Okay, what happened in between? It's a cultural identity. If you can tie that with economic development, if that becomes central to it, then maybe we have a different paradigm to move forward with it. That's the kind of the goal right now is to anchor into these stories. This is the cover of my, my next book. And one of the things that I most love about it is that this to me is Ethiopia, okay? This is, you have this man here, oops, this man here who's in a tribal costume, he's the king of his tribe, the Mesa of Marsha. You have this little girl with a British flag. You got the naked bum of the little kid, which is really fun, right? You got all these people, you have this traditional Ethiopia, but then you have what is really Ethiopia now. It's all conflated, it's all together, and these stories are kind of what are gonna unify it. 
So about three weeks ago, I was back in Ethiopia. And for the first time, I've been working in and around Ethiopia for three years since my first book came out. I was back where I was climbing. And there's this really well-loved copy of my book that's at this lodge, this Italian lodge that they just built there. And I sat down with a lodge manager, and we thumbed through it. And he was thanking me for bringing climbing to Ethiopia. And he said to me, for, he, I sat down, and he said, your book changed this region. And I looked at him and I said, no, I don't, you know, I think that this, I was just really lucky. And he said, no, no. He said, I want to hear more stories about climbing. Is that what you're here and doing? And I made him a deal. I said, I'll tell you stories about climbing if you tell me stories about coffee. And we sat down, we had, we drank coffee for three hours, and he shared stories which are going to now delay the publication of my book so that I can put them in there. I had a friend come up to me, I think about three weeks ago, and he sat me down and he was really worried about the work I'm doing. And he said, you know, I'm really worried that you're putting yourself out there too much. The fact that you think that you can change Ethiopia through coffee and through stories about coffee is really disturbing. And I looked at him and I smiled and I thanked him for the compliment. Thanks. <laughs>